If you have your Bibles, I want to talk to us for a few minutes. And if you have pen and paper or your notes on your uh, phone, um, and some of the young folks said, pen and paper, what is that? <laughs> well, some of us still take notes with paper and pencil, amen, or a pen. So if you have that, you're going to want to jot down at the end of this passage, uh, at the end of this message, I'm going to give you some things uh, that you're going to want to write down. And uh, we're going to be looking, if you have your Bibles, be turning to Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now, how many of you watch any kind of news, whether it be uh, 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 Communist News Network, CNN, or, or Fox News, or ABC, or whatever it is? How many of you watch, listen to some news of some sort, whether in radio, television? Okay. Okay, the rest of you need to listen to some. A lot of stuff going on that you wouldn't be happy with. <clears throat> and uh, here's, the, here's the thing about uh, you, you can't, just because you cut the radio off or the news channel off doesn't mean it goes away. And so since it's still out there, we need to be attentive to what's happening so we know how to combat things, right? So I want to encourage you, don't get discouraged when you listen to the news, but be encouraged because there's a God that is in control. Do you know he hadn't just left it? He just didn't walk and said, man, that's crazy, <laughs> and walked off the scene. That's not what happened. Uh, it's, it's lining up the way it's supposed to line up. But while we're here, we got to deal with some things, right? And so after praying and uh, I made mention a little bit last week about I don't know what's going to happen to the church um, in, in, in the near future. And I mean near future, near future, because things are coming rapidly. But I want you to know you can be encouraged. And the only way that we're going to get through these times that are to come are, is we're going to have to have an encounter with God. I'm not talking about a Sunday morning high five patty cake thing and you know about God. I'm talking about you need an encounter with God because your life and your family's life depend on it. Have you ever uh, felt like you were in a rut spiritually? You just couldn't get any traction. I mean, you, 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 you're doing what was necessary. You, you read your Bible and you prayed and you came to church regularly and you, and you tithed and you done all the things that Christians are supposed to do. But yet you could get no traction. It's like you, you, you wanted to move this way and that rut so deep. You just couldn't get out of it. If you ever been on a farm and, you know, in the fall of the year when we used to uh, cut crops in November, December, and January was normal, and you would go and you would uh, uh, try to get the grain out of the field, and there would, my dad would always say, now get in the runway. And that's where you'd already made some tracks because it had some good solid soil in there. But I'm telling you, you just let go of the wheel. And drive fast because you wasn't going anywhere where those ruts were already. It'd just keep you in that rut. And you'd try to get out of them sometimes and you'd hit the brake to try to jump over the, and you were still in that rut. You ever feel like that? Man, I feel like that sometimes. We're just in a rut, spiritually speaking, and we can't get out of it. And you're, and you're kind of aggravated. You're aggravated at maybe God. Maybe aggravated at yourself. Well, what am I doing wrong? It's nothing you're doing wrong sometimes. It's just you're in a rut. Have you ever wanted something so bad that that's all you can think about? I mean, you really wanted something. Maybe it was a material possession or, or you wanted to go on a trip or you wanted this or that. You wanted, I mean, you just, you would do anything for that. I remember growing up, you know, as, as teenage boys, we wanted a truck. Of course, we had uh, uh, specifications. It had to be jacked up in a four-wheel drive. Come on. And man, we'd do every, we would work extra and we would, we would con our parents into helping us with half of the down payment. And we're going to make the payments and we're going to do all this. And man, we would, man, we want that so bad. We would just about sell our souls. Come on, somebody. And, and, and now we're older. I don't want anything jacked up. I don't want anything. I got to, I, nothing. Okay. I don't want anything I got to fall in or, or crawl out of. I don't want anything I got to climb in or fall out of. You see what I'm saying? I don't want any of that. Okay? It's called wisdom now <clears throat> or old age. But there's certain things you, know, you really want really bad. You think, man, I'll do anything for that. Man, I'd love to have. And that's your, you, 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 
you would spend money. Maybe it's a maybe it's a child. Maybe you, you hadn't had you hadn't been able to have a children or 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 whatever it is. Maybe it's a home or or something. You'd do anything for it. You would give anything for it. But I want to talk to us today on this topic: an encounter with God. What if I told you I knew of something that if you sought after it, you could have it? And it would change your life forever. I remember my first vehicle. It didn't change my life forever. Oh, it was fun for a season. Then guess what? When the new wore off, you wanted another one. And when the new wore off there, you wanted another one. And when you heard those rattles and those scratches and those dings, you wanted another one. And it was, it was temporary satisfaction. But I'm here to tell you, in the midst of all the stuff that's going on today, I know of something that if you go after, you can have it. And it won't cost you an arm and a leg. There's something that you need, that we need as a church, that I need as a pastor, that I need as a husband, as a father, as a brother, as a son. There's something that I need and that you need today. And you can have it if you seek after it. Watch, stay with me. Would you pursue it if I told you there's something you could have? Would you say, I want it? I really want it. If I said there's something you could have, if I offered you a million dollars, there's not a person in this room that'd say, no, nah, I don't want that. There would be a line from here to the Eudor red light because the word would spread so fast that the pastor's giving away a million dollars, but you gotta get in line and you gotta go after it. Come on now, y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not giving away a million dollars. Not today. I'm giving away something more valuable. Way more valuable than temporary things. What if I told you this thing was Jesus? Oh. It's a letdown. I mean, <laughs> I'm here, ain't I? Come on, I'm going to preach in just a minute. I mean, you know, I'm after him, right? I come to church this morning. I could have been somewhere else. I mean, I was really hoping you was going to give us something else like a pass to free food tonight. Come on, that's the way we view God a lot of times in the world today. You say, oh, I don't know about that, Pastor. That's why we are in the shape that we're in. Because we have taken God out of the picture. We don't pursue God like we should. I remember years ago when I started out, and I'll finish my little story, how we used to lay under the pews after so long of having church service because God was doing work in people's lives. People would come because they were hungry to see. They, they needed God in their lives. Now we don't need God, Jamie. He's just an accessory, as I preached a few weeks ago, to our lives. We don't really need him. We got good incomes. We got health insurance. We got good homes. We got electric that never hardly ever goes out. We got all of these things. I don't really need God. I, and our groceries. Uh, I remember stories growing up where people would pray, and they, would, they needed groceries. And God would send some, put it on somebody's heart to bring by a bill of groceries. That's a bag of groceries nowadays. A bill of groceries to someone. They depended on God. And today we don't depend on God. Come on now, hear me. Really for nothing. Did you hear me? We don't depend on God really for anything. Not really. Now we should. But we really don't. Very few people get up in the morning and say, thank God, thank you, God, for, for providing for me the monies to keep the lights on in the house, to have air conditioning and heat, to buy candy to give out last night if you participated in all that. Whatever it is, gas money, vehicle money. Very few people thank God for that. Come on, think about this now. I'm being real. You get up and you say, hmm, whew, I did it because I worked hard. I got it because I got a good job. I got an education. That's, that's how we got what we got. No, you got what you got because God chooses to bless you. 
The moment God says, I don't want to bless you, guess what? You won't be blessed. Everything you put your hand to will fail, guaranteed. God says he, he raises up the kingdoms and he tears them down. He sets up kings and he takes kings down. He blesses those whom he chooses. It has nothing to do with you. God chooses you so you can be a blessing to somebody else. That's the purpose that you have stuff. The things that you have, friends, if you listen to me, you'll get something out of this because I am going to go somewhere. But the things that you have in your possessions today are tools to spread the gospel. Come on. It is, it is not for you to uh, hoard up and enjoy completely for yourself. The Bible does say that we could, should and could and can enjoy the fruit of our hands, the labor of our hands. You would enjoy your increase. No question about that. But to hoard it up and say it's all about me, every dime I get is going to be spent on me. It's not for anybody else. It's for me and my family because God set me up this way. No, ma'am, no, sir. There are tools that you only get to Occupy and use for a little season because I can assure you no one will take one thing when they leave this earth. Not one thing. You will leave everything that God has entrusted to you right here. I'll tell you a little story. It's not part of my message, but I feel the Lord want me to say this. Remember the story of the talents, the one, the three, and the five? And what did the master went away? It's symbolic of Jesus going away, coming back and going to return. The master went away. He comes back and he goes to the guy that he gave five talents to. And he said, uh, the, the, the servant come to him and said, here's five talents. You gave me five and here's five plus. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Goes to the guy with the third talent, the third, the three talents. What is it? Same thing. You gave me three. Here's three more. Well done, my good and faithful servant. He goes to the guy that he gives one. And the servant comes to him and said, I knew you to be a hard man. You gave me one. Here it is back. I often thought, why would he do that? He didn't lose anything. Carl, he didn't lose a thing. He gave him exactly what he'd been given. The problem was he didn't do anything with what God had given him. He said it was all his. He hoarded it up and he kept it to himself. If you have finances, if you have resources, if you have things where you can bless people, sir, ma'am, you better start blessing some folks. You better start, get your mind wrapped around what God's principles is. Now, I'm not coming up with, it's right in the Bible. But if you get your mind wrapped around the principles, God will say, what did he say? He said, take from him who had the one and give to him who had much. What is the principle? If you, God will take what you have, if you look to him, if you'll encounter God, if you'll take what he's given you and double it, resource it out, help people, bless people, your increase will come. Amen. It's a biblical principle. And I'm not preaching on tithing. Not a bit. But it works for money just as well. Come on. Would you still pursue this thing if I told you it was Jesus? Would you still go after it with everything? Would you still give up everything? Oh, we may say that, but we really won't. Everything? You say, oh, well, Pastor, you don't know me. I don't, but I understand what the Bible says. There was this rich young ruler one time, and he had kept the law perfectly. In other words, he had went to church, he had tithed, he had blessed people, done all those things. And then he said, what must I do? He said, sell everything you got. <laughs> no, now, Lord, I must not be hearing from God. That's what we would say. Well, that ain't God. Tell your spouse that when everything you got paid for. I'm going to sell everything we got. Huh? Pick another God to listen to. That's what she's going to tell you. Come on. Are we, would we pursue God with everything? Do you pursue God with everything? Do you pursue God right now and, and, and are able to keep everything you got? Probably not. I've never known anybody and I've been in ministry and around ministry my whole life, 54 years. I've never known anybody to have to sell everything. Have you? I, I'm, not, I'm not, not. Not everything. Oh, they've given up some few, but not everything. God's probably not going to ask you to do that. So let's look at this, what the Word of God says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. I won't be too much longer. Remember, have your pens and pencils ready, your paper, your, your, your note-taking device. 
Now Moses was heading into Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He had some possessions. Jethro had some possessions. He had a flock. He was a priest, so he, he had some possessions, okay? Enough so that his son-in-law uh, needed to be hired to take care of a flock. So not just your normal Joe, okay? I want you to understand that. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And verse 2, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Remember this, we'll come back to it in a minute. Because it was burning wasn't a great sight. The great sight was that it wasn't consumed. Okay? Remember that. Verse 4, so when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Anytime you hear a repeat in God's word, it said, that means pay attention. I'm trying to get your attention. You ever had your mama call your name twice? Usually right after my mama called my name twice, there was an abrupt something on my body. A hand, a belt, a board, a broom, something. She was trying to get my attention, amen? Maybe the Lord needs to break out a broom. And he said to him, this is what Moses said, he said, and he said to him, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to to look upon God. Now, I want to talk to you this, this morning about six things. There's six things that you must do to encounter God. Now, there may be a bunch of others, but looking at this scripture and how Moses encountered God, we can find six things that allowed Moses, a a, a shepherd boy, a shepherd man at this time, he's about 40-ish, give or take, to encounter the God of the universe I mean, somebody that's in a deserted place that God picked out and he encountered God. You may feel like you're in that rut and you can't encounter God, that you're in a deserted place and nothing's going to happen different in your life. Well, maybe God's just getting you in the right place and intersecting you at the right time with him to show up in your life. Don't give up yet. Now watch this. Number one. We find it in verse one. Let's read verse one again. Now Moses was was tending the flock. He was at work. Do you hear me? He was tending the flock. When you tend a flock, have done a little research, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You cannot let the flock go unattended. You have to attend the flock. When they go to sleep, you try to put them in a canyon or some kind of corral, and you sleep in the place where the gate was so nothing can come in or nothing can go out. It's 24-7. So watch my number one thing. Quit saying you don't have time. That's the number one excuse. I don't have time to serve God. I don't have time to go to the church. I mean, that's a bunch of clickish people over there to go to the church all the time. I don't have time to go do this for the Lord. I am busy because, you know, I'm going to tithe, and without my tithe, the church is going to fall. Sir or ma'am, you're, this church will not fall without your tithe. You can give or don't give, but God will put somebody in the place that will give. I've had people come and give in this church that I didn't think had one red cent to their name. And give more than I ever thought I even had. Come on. They did give more than I had. I mean, not I'm talking about that I thought I had. One time, and I'm thinking, oh. You say, we don't have time. I don't have time to serve God. I'm busy. I got to take this. I got to do this. I got to. You're no more busier than Moses was. 
He was 24-7, 24-7, tending the sheep. So number one, quit saying you don't have time. Number two, we find that uh, also in verse one. <clears throat> Let's read the verse again. I'm going to finish the verse this time. He was tending flock uh, of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, that's so odd to me because I, I do know what Horeb is, and I do know what the mountain of God is, and they seem to be two different places altogether because Horeb means a deserted place, a desolate. Matter of fact, it's, it, he says on the backside of the desert. I mean, it was like in the desert, but now it's on the backside of that. You ever been to those places? We don't refer to them as desert. There's another little phrase that some of you refer to them as they're over there. Moses finds himself in this deserted place. Number two is you will have to get to a deserted, uninhabited place. In other words, uninhabited by the things of this world before you encounter God. You come in and plan patty cake with God probably is not going to get it done. If you want to encounter God, look, he's a God to be reverent, a God to be sought after. And there's got to be a time and a place in that you set aside daily. Come on now. At, at minimum, weekly, to encounter this God of the universe. Do you understand who we're talking about? The God of the universe. And you think that you can just waltz in on your leisurely schedule and say, God, I've got my list of excuses why I can't encounter you. But while I'm here, could you bless me? Could I encounter you? Let me give you a couple of more statements about not uh, finding yourself in a deserted, uninhabited place. What may look like a nothing place to the world or even you just might be where God wants to meet with you. In your rut, when you want to quit because you don't feel the presence of God in the church and you don't feel the presence of God in your car and you don't feel him when you worship and you're in a rut and you want to quit, you want to get out of the rut, you want to do something different. Sometimes it's right there when you don't see God, when you don't feel God, when nobody's talking about God around you, that God shows up. Moses is in a deserted place. He's the only human probably within miles with a bunch of dumb sheep. And God shows up to him. First of all, Glenn and never speaks a word. Shows up to him in a most unusual way, we think. Watch this. Number one, quit saying you don't have time. Number two, you will have to get to a deserted place. In other words, you got to get you and God all alone. God's got to get you by yourself. God's got to get you out from your stuff that you do, your agenda, your, your meetings. He's got to get you out of your schedule. Come on. I know that's hard for some of you because you think the minute that you don't keep your schedule, the world will absolutely stop in its tracks. Well, friend, I have something to tell you. That is a lie. You will even put your agenda above your family. Bobby Miller had wise words one time to me. I don't know if you remember this. When I was farming out by you, you told me, you told me, you looked me in the eye and you said, now Marty, remember, this farm's not the most important thing in your life. You remember telling me that, Mr. Bobby? Man, that stuck with me. My agenda is not the most important thing in my life. God's agenda in my life is the most important thing, and it needs to be in yours as well if you want to encounter God. Number three, we find in verse two, you will have to look for him where you may not have ever seen him before. Woo! I don't know what that was, but I about left him. <clears throat> Because I thought God was sneaking up on me. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> you will have to look for him where you may not have ever seen him before. Let's look at verse 2. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. I don't know about you, but God's never showed up to me in a flaming bush. I've never seen lightning strike across the sky. I, I, I haven't seen any manifestation necessarily like that in my life. Heard of a few things, but I haven't myself. This is what I've... Now, I begin to study, and I understand that this type of bush, spontaneously combusting into a ball of fire, wasn't that uncommon in those days. I mean, it's obviously dry, right? It was in the desert. Matter of fact, on the other side, the back side of the desert, it was a dry place. Did lightning strike? I don't know. Didn't say. But the bush starts. <laughs> now, that would get my attention right off the bat. Right? <laughs> there it is. Hmm. But what? look at Moses. Let's, let's read two. It says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of a, a midst of a bush. So he looked. Hmm. And behold, the bush was burning with fire. That didn't amuse Moses. He had seen that before, I'm sure, as a shepherd on the back side of the desert. That wasn't a big deal to him. <laughs> but look at that right there. What caught his attention was, in the midst of this fire, he could see the structure of the branches and the leaves. One commentary says that when God does something, he does it so miraculously, so uniquely, that he believed, this commentator, believed that even the leaves didn't even burn. And Moses saw in the midst of this fire the burning bush, but the bush was not burnt. Do we have any firemen in here? That people go off, y'all run out this thing like you herd a cow. Now raise up your hand to be a fireman in here. We got a couple. So there's three things that you need for fire. Come on. You need, can y'all want to help me? You need Fuel, oxygen, and you got to have a source for it to start. Three things. Without those three, you can't have fire. It's impossible. You got to have source, you got to have fuel, you got to have oxygen. Obviously, though, those things were there, right? Because it was on fire. But what really was the source? What was, what's the fuel in a burning bush? It should be the bush, it should be the branches, the leaves, right? But in this situation, in this circumstance, the fuel was removed. But the bush was still burning. You say, I don't believe it. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. I'm just reading what the Word of God says. Here's the problem. When we want to encounter God, we have the same thing. I don't know if I believe that. God can do great things in your life. I don't know if I believe that. He just did those for you. And we, we're like, I don't know. If you've ever been in bondage to something, held back, and I'm not talking about some addiction. I'm not talking about maybe necessary drugs. And alcohol. I'm talking about in bondage to, to hatred, to anger. I was in bondage to anger. I, I hang, hanger, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> to anger. I was in bondage to that. I was. My family was in bondage to, to, to my anger problem. But when God begins to set you free, things change. Come on. And God says, I, if I looked at my life, I could look back generation after generation and say, no, I'm always going to be that way because it's in me. The fuel's in me for that to explode. But God says, wait a minute, I can do things that mortal man cannot do. I can do things in your life if you'll encounter me and let me that'll just blow your mind away, that won't seem natural, that, matter of fact, will be unnatural, that it'll confound the psychologist. Why is he not angry no more? Jesus. Jesus can do things if you'll let him. Oh, I called on him. I called on Jesus to help me with this, and I called on him. Did you submit to him? Did you, as Moses did, he says uh, in verse 2, And behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. I want to change it just a little bit. You need to let God consume you. Some of us are looking for miracles, and that's all we want. 
We want the hand of God. We want the, the provisions of God. But we don't really want God. We just want God to show up in our situation. And God says, that's not the way I operate. I'll be number one or I'll be nothing. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I got to hurry up. So number, number one, you got to quit saying you don't have time. Number two, you got to get alone or get to a deserted, uninhabited place with God. Number three, you will have to look for him where you may have never seen him before. Never. So your dry spot, you may have never been there before. But God may be saying, that's right where I need you. Right in that rut. So there's no other option. Number four. We find in verse 3, it says, you must make a conscious decision to have your plans interrupted. Preacher, you were doing good till you got to right there. You mean to tell me that I, I may have to interrupt what I want to do to encounter God? Where's that God you talk about? If you take one step, he'll come to rest. Where, 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 where's that God of Jeremiah 29, 11? Oh, I, got, I know the plans for you and they to bless you and prosper you. I want that God. But you mean I got to do something? I find nowhere in Scripture where God does everything. Watch. Verse 3. Then Moses said, watch, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Watch this. This is why he wasn't amused at just the fire. Why? This is, he's telling you why he's amused at this. It's not, the, it's not because of the fire. It's because of this last phrase. Why the bush does not burn. See, if you slow down and you read Scripture, you'll pick out what is going on in the Scripture. He wasn't amused by the fire. He was amused. Something caught his attention because it was not, the bush was not burned. See, you've got to make a conscious decision sometimes to say, God, I'm going to follow you, and it may interrupt my plans or what I wanted to do. But it's, you are so intriguing to me. I need you so much, whatever your situation is, that I want to turn and see what's happening. I need a change in my life. See, coming to church to do the same old thing over and over, you say, well, I ain't amused with that. Well, neither am I if it makes you feel any better. I'm not amused that people come to church. I'm not unamused if they don't come to church. Come on. You ought to come to church. You ought to love God. What gets me is when people say, I want an encounter with God, and they see a transformation in their life. They turn aside and say, God, I've been, I know all about that life. I've been doing that. I've done that, got the book, got the T-shirt, wrote the book, all. But, God, I want to know, what, what do you have? What do you have for me, God? Come on, if you want to encounter God, you got to be willing to have your plans interrupted. And until you are, hear me out. Until you are, you're not going to have a true encounter with God. I can talk to anybody in this room that, had, that has had, a, that was one way and had a radical change in their, I mean, talking about just went from 180 degrees. And they'll say, I chose or something happened. There was a major moment in my life. They could point to that, bam, there it is, and say, I had an encounter with God. And from that moment on, what did you, you chose. You said, God, interrupt my plans. I'm sick of living the way I'm living. This ain't working for me. All right, so you get in these. Number one, quit saying you don't have time. Number two, get to a, an uninhabited or deserted place. Number three, you will have to look for him where you may not have ever seen him. Number four, you must make a conscious decision to have your plans interrupted. Moses had a job to take care of sheep. Consciously, he said, I'm going to go see what's going on over here because God's moving right there. God's doing that. 
Number five, you must be willing. <clears throat> Number, verse four. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, what happened? What? Read the verse with me. When the Lord saw, <clears throat> is it up on the screen? Can we read today? <laughs> So when the Lord saw that he turned aside, who saw who do what? The Lord saw that Moses had turned aside. The, the Lord didn't roll the burning bush in front of Moses and say, man, I hope he sees it. I bet this is different. He says in his word that Moses, if you will, turned, he looked, and he said, and so when the Lord saw that he, meaning Moses, turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, can you imagine? You're in the desert, nobody around. You've seen burning, a burning bush before, and this one's already different. You got thousand sheep and they meow, 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 whatever they do <laughs> and you make a decision to leave them to go look at a burning bush and you get in front of the bush I don't know how close he was this might have been one of those fake flames that you know you can touch you know like probably wasn't and so he gets there and he hears words coming out of a bush I don't know about you I'm not that spooked, but probably at that moment, I'm probably out of there, okay? I'm running back to Jethro and saying, I don't want to have these sheep. Somebody stole them. I killed them all, but I'm here by myself. Thank God I got away. <laughs> it's funny, ain't it? That's what happens when we know God speaks to us. We know God's speaking to us, and we say, mm, I don't like that. I know what that means. I'm going to have to do some changing. And if I got to change, I don't know if I'm going to follow God. Because I like doing what I do. I like me the way I am. I like my life. I like my stuff. I like my routine. I like my things. I like, I like this the way it is. And I don't want to be interrupted by God or anybody else. So what I'll do is I will shun the voice of God. I won't listen to it. I won't hear him. If I turn it off, he's not speaking to me. Friend, I have some terrible news for you. Whether you're listening or not, he's speaking. He speaks to you all the time. It's just you may not be listening. But he's speaking you. He's wooing you. He's trying to get you to follow him. He's trying to speak you to you in your unusual condition and in your place because he wants to encounter you. What did it say? He saw Moses. Then he looked. And then God... Boom, shows up and begins to speak to him. My God, I wish the Lord would begin to speak to us today and we would listen. I wish we would listen to what God is telling us. I'm telling you, we're going into perilous times and without an encounter with God, it's not going to be good. I believe with all of my heart there's going to be persecution in the church in America. I believe there's going to be a choice. You will have to make up and consciously make a decision that I will go to church with my family and I may encounter some authorities at the door. I might even get arrested. I might even get censored. I might even get a little uh, check by my name that says I'm not a good community person anymore and be flagged because you're a Christian. Pastor, you're talking about something way over somewhere else. Yes, it's already over there. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about him coming here. And friends, it's coming faster than what you think. You can sit in this church. You can ignore. You can play with your card, your phone, your cars, your kids, whatever it is you want to do, all, every church service we ever have. And just ignore it. And think it's going to be all right. If I can just get out of this church service here. I won't feel so bad because I've got good plans for me this afternoon. Ooh, you know I love you. (laughs) 
verse 4 says, it, the, the fifth thing says, you must be willing. And here it is, verse 4. So when he turned, he said, Moses, uh, Moses, and he said, Moses said, here I am. Here I am. What happened in Moses' life when he made those three words, when, 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 he, when he spoke those three words? The children of Israel, eventually, as we know the story now, were set free from bondage. Children of Israel. Right? God used him mightily. You know, he couldn't speak very well. Probably had a stutter in tongues, what they say. Some uh, scholars even think, well, he was probably uh, ha- had, had a speech problem, so he also maybe had a hearing problem. Boy, this took your problems right out the water, didn't it? <laughs> you ain't got any problem now, do you? Because some of you can talk. Mm, Come on, let me finish. Number six. You must have, hear me out, and I'm going to close with this. If I can have the, the, uh, honey, come on up. If I can close with this, verse five. You must have a holy reverence of God. You must have a holy reverence of God. We don't have that very much anymore. We don't have that in the church house very much. And the place where we meet with God. You couldn't even approach the temple in the Old Testament if you were just a regular old person. Because they didn't deem you as reverent enough. Of course, the cross changed a lot of things, but what it did not change was the reverence that you're supposed to have for a holy God. It did not change that. Grace does not change that. Do you hear me? There's not enough grace to change it. You are to have a holy reverence for God, for the things of God, for the house of God, for His presence. In other words, you got to want to be in that area, want to be in His presence. There's not a person in this room doesn't want to be doesn't want to be around somebody they don't like. Now God likes you a lot, a whole lot. He wants to be around you, but He won't force you to be around Him. Watch this in verse in verse five. Then He said to Moses, "Do not draw near this place." What was so special about a burning bush on the backside of a desert? Absolutely nothing except that there was a holy God that was present right right where Moses was. It was just a dirty piece of ground. But when God shows up, it changes everything. You may be in a place in your life where you say, well, I'm I'm beat up. I'm undone. I'm just, I'm trash. I'm broken. And nothing God can do. But when God shows up, he changes everything in your life changes it and God is to be reverent he's a holy God he says this in verse 5 do not draw near this place take your sandals off of your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground I wish we treated the church and I wish we treated God like Moses treated the backside of a desert with a burning bush. We don't reverence God. We don't honor God. We want God to honor us in our society. God, you must honor me. Your word says, your word says you're going to bless me. Your word says you're going to prosper me. It does say that. But you're out of context if that's your thoughts. First, There's reverence and honor to God that must be given, that must be. It's not optional. He's a holy God. You won't enter into his presence if you got spot or wrinkle. The Bible says you'll be white as snow. Spot or wrinkle, he does not accept. He's a holy God. He is to be reverent. He's to be honored. When we come into our church services, praise God with our agendas. Hope they don't sing too long. Hope they sing my favorite song. 
hope they sing that one a long time. And my God, I hope the preacher don't preach very long. And if he does preach one of those hard messages, I hope it's to my neighbor because they really need Jesus. But I'm good because I read my Bible every day. If you're not honoring God, listen to me. If you're not honoring God, you just well read Cosmopolitan or whatever the whatever the books are now. You just read you a one of them old crazy novels get you about the same come on when you open God's word you ought to be saying Lord let your word speak to me you're a holy God that has me in mind and I want to know what you have for me I want to have an encounter with you God we're not asking God to have Shannon we're not asking God to have an encounter with us trying to do our Christian duty I've done my thing God bless me my God church we've got to get this we have got to get that there's a holy God and then we've got to have an encounter for him if not for you my God for your kids for your kids for our grandbabies we've got to have an encounter with God anything short of that it's not going to be enough. It's just not going to be enough. I was talking to someone just the other day. And I said, I feel like for two years, all I've preached was beat me up kind of messages. Nothing Jeremiah 29, 11 by sure. Nothing like that, but kind of beat me up messages, and I want to quit sometimes. And the Lord begins to speak to me. Say, that's what my people need to hear all across the land. Church, we got to hear these messages. We've watered down and said, you can get to heaven anything. You, you just give a God a, a good wink and a good nod and you're in. But I'm here to tell you, that's not the way it works. If you give God a nod and you commit to him and you surrender to him and you make him Lord and you make him master and then you can get in, you serve him. He's not to serve you. But we've heard it for so long. Grace, you can do whatever you want to, whenever you want to, with whomever you want to, as long as you want to do it, and you're in the gates. Well, friend, that is contrary to God's Word. God's Word said that wide, wide is the gate that leads to hell, and narrow is that road that leads to eternal life in Christ Jesus. Narrow! One commentator said, and because of the size of the pass should tell us the amount of foot traffic that's going to be on each one. The Lord is coming soon. I'm talking about soon. We used to have a little saying, I'm looking for him in the morning. And if, I don't, if he don't come in the morning, I'm looking for him at noon. And if he don't come at noon, I'm looking for him at night. We've gotten away from that. We think it's never going to happen in our lifetime. That we've got time and we can do all we want to. Friend, I'm here to tell you that Jesus is calling you and begging you today to get right with him. To encounter him. To fall in love with him. To serve him. For what purpose? To spread this beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you and I both have loved ones that will die and they will go to hell for eternity. While we call ourselves some super Christian involved in the church, a deacon in the church, and yet our loved ones never hear one peep from us about Jesus Christ being Lord and a Savior. Church, it is so time. It is so time that we say, I'm going to encounter God and I'm going to get rid of my, I'm going to get rid of my excuses. I'm going to be intentional. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for those things. While I'm in a rut, my God, I'll be looking for God. God, are you on this side or are you on this side? God, are you in the front? God, do you want me to keep following you? God, wherever you are, that's where I want to be. God, if it's right in this rut, Lord, you teach me something while I'm here. Lord, so that when I get out of the rut, I'll be able to be a better minister. I'll be able to be a better person for you, God. Whatever it is you have for me, God, show me while I'm here. Show me while I'm here, God. Show me. Don't let me leave this place till I grab you. Don't let me leave this place till I've encountered a holy God and I leave a changed person. Don't let me leave this place. Church, if you have never thought you needed to get right and encounter God, I'm telling you, today is a day of reckoning. Today is a day you need to come clean with God. Quit playing with God. Quit thinking you've done it all on your own. God loves you and he wants you to serve him with your whole heart. Will you stand with me across this building? Oh God.